This week's episode made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com. Good morning, Memphis. Happy Tuesday to you. If you are just now tuning in and changing that dial, you are listening to Meanwhile in Memphis on WYXR Radio 91.7 FM. And we have a treat today. We always do, really and truly. I mean, but we're especially excited for this particular guest. But before I get to the guest today... Guess who's back? <laughs> back again. <laughs> Guess who's not getting any more coffee? That would be Aaron Wendell. <laughs> Who can't sing, but is pleased to be back as a co-host this week. Love it. Love it. Um, so if you are a fan of Aaron being a repeat co-host, just let us know over at info at newmemphis.org. We did get a call last week during our on-air segment about making sure that we um, stated who our guest was multiple times. So I will try to make sure that we do that. But if I don't, yeah, I, I'm a work in progress, ladies and gents. It is a, it is an early morning day. So early and, morning And if you today. got something nice to say, mom always said, Keep it to yourself. No. <laughs> Just kidding. It's important to learn and grow. Yes, we, it is. We respect and appreciate your feedback, Memphis. We absolutely do. So, without further ado, with that feedback, our guest today is the one and only Carmian Hamilton. You might know her as a designer, a blogger, the grand prize winner of Design Star Next Gen, or the star of her very own show, Reno My Rental, on HGTV. Love it. But first and foremost, she is also a Memphian by choice. She did grow up in West Memphis. So we will we will extend our arms across the river over there to her. And we're just really, really excited that she made some time in her very, very busy schedule to drop by our studio. So without further ado, here is our conversation with Carmian Hamilton. Well, welcome to the studio, Carmian. How is your morning? It is just getting started. Um, <laughs> I'm not a morning person, but yes, nor am excited I. to be here. Yes, <laughs> lots of cups of coffee have made this uh, a reality for you, dear mm-hmm. listener. Mm-hmm. Um, so we wanted to kind of jump right in. Um, you are no stranger to a microphone or being in the spotlight. Uh, I would say that I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) But can you give us, uh, for those who might not have heard of you and are, I guess, living under a rock, dear listener, um, can you give us the the Spark Notes version of the past? I'll give you you the the fast version. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my name is Carmion Hamilton. I am a Memphis-based interior designer, blogger, and content creator, and public speaker. Um, I have been in design for... 15 years now and have my own design business, Newbie Interiors, and also have won HGTV's Design Star Next Gen, which led to having my own show, Rental My Rental, for HGTV. Woohoo! Yeah. And you've probably seen her beautiful face on every other publication, (laughs) nationally and locally. (laughs) And you're a Memphis native. Ish, Technically, correct. I am a West Memphis native, so I'm from right across the bridge. I've been in Memphis for 10 years, so, okay. so technically. We, we, we will claim yeah, you. I, I've, I, <laughs> I've Memphis already claimed Memphis. Memphis metropolitan area. <laughs> I've already claimed it, so you guys can't get rid of me now. <laughs> I love it. Memphis roots run deep like that. Oh, yes, they do. So I am going to start us off with kind of a uh, kind of a boomerang question. You've been asked a lot in a lot of different interviews, and mm-hmm. so is there something that no one has tackled yet that you would that you wish they would have asked you? Hmm. I don't know. I've done a lot I know you've of done. interviews because <laughs> that's what we, in our in our sense of research we were like, what can we ask her that has not already been asked? That's a good one. I would say parenting, but I remember I did a whole parenting <laughs> blo- a podcast with another podcast, Motherly. Like that was mm. it was oh, one yeah. of my favorites because I don't get to talk about my role as a mom a lot, um, and I feel like I have a pretty unique perspective and yeah. Uh, and lots of unique thoughts about parenting, so mm-hmm. it was it was fun. But I've talked about it before. Well, be so. sure to give your son a shout out. Hi, Davin. He's not going to listen to this. He doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Again, he, he's just like whatever, mom. He's very much a whatever, mom. He's thirteen, almost fourteen. So wow. it's I, hard to impress him. A lovely age. Oh, it's the for best. All children. That is sarcasm for yes. your lovely yes. listeners. <laughs> Good morning, listener. That is sarcasm. Um, So tell us a little bit about that unique perspective. I mean, it's got to 
I'm a working mother anyway, just mm-hmm. generally speaking. And so that's, I feel like, an interesting, intricate balance. Yes. But I'm sure that your perspective as a global icon as well. That definitely triggers a few things, for sure. Um, well, when my son was born, my husband and I both wanted the approach uh, or wanted to make sure he was a kid for as long as humanly possible. Um, we have lots of cousins and God kids and everything. And I mean, by the time they're eight, they, they know way too much mm-hmm. about the world and things that are beyond eight-year-old minds. Um, and so we did a lot in the beginning to kind of shield him from too much information too soon. Yeah. So he didn't get a cell phone until he was almost 13. Retweet, retweet. Yes. yes. <laughs> He's not on any social media platforms. He still has all of the child uh, parenting protective things on everything he gets on from YouTube yep. to mm-hmm. video games. Like he still can't download whatever he wants on his phone. And we just make sure like he he's not concerned about adult things like money or I don't even think he has a concept of money, but he he's not, not yeah not, not the need for not it. the need for yeah. it yes so he's not concerned. My husband and I both had our first jobs at fourteen, and I'm like if I can prevent that in a way while also teaching him responsibility, yeah. mm-hmm. then I would love for that to be the case. Neither of us needed jobs at fourteen, but they became necessary down the line Mm -hmm. um but also having a job that soon you become an adult because it's that much responsibility and then okay what do you do with your money and all of those things and like that's wonderful in the grand scheme of things but as as a 14 year old like what are you really responsible for outside of your grades and having a good life um so we were like okay Keep him a kid as long as possible, but also not shelter him from the world. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure he stayed in public school. We were both products of public school mm-hmm. educations and both have great educations and went on to do amazing things yes. with our public school education. And in the city of Memphis, it's tricky, but I'm going to support this city any way that I can. And I am i don't feel like... Even trying to be a great parent, I, I feel like the public school system here can be everything that our kids need if we support the public school system. So if we agree, yeah. continue pulling out of it and running, running away, away from yeah. it, mm-hmm. then it will never be what it needs to be. So I'm not going to be part of the problem of our public school system. So I'm going to support it in any way that I can. Love to hear that as a former educator myself and as someone who now supports uh, public educators here in Memphis through, oh, that's amazing. through the work at New Memphis. So thank you. Yes. And my, my mother and my grandmother were both school teachers. Oh, and I so I, I have a, a heart for educators and the public school system. So it's it was just one of those non-negotiables that we adopted when it was time for him to go to school. Excellent. I mean, being a kid is just so fun. Uh, who wouldn't want to hold on to it a little longer? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Like, you have the rest of your life to be an adult. To be a, <laughs> and that's the thing. That's the thing. Like, why should you be concerned about being responsible for clocking in at a job? Like, I don't want to clock in at a job right now. And thankfully, <laughs> I don't. But as a kid, you definitely shouldn't have to be thinking about, OK, how do I do school? How do I get my homework done and go do this job? And uh, and it's it's great teaching kids responsibility. But I'm also like it's still you're still a kid. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. You'll have your whole life to be responsible. Enjoy this while you can stay a kid as long as possible. Thinking about you as as the Renaissance woman with all of the titles um, <laughs> you, you have to use when introducing yourself and starting work at 14. And this investment in Memphis, I'm curious what it was like starting a business in Memphis and why you chose to put down those roots here as you created Nubi Interiors. Mm. Well, I worked remotely when remote working wasn't even a thing for a healthcare company that was based in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I lived in Fort Smith for four years and then married and relocated to Missouri to be with my husband. Um, And then we moved here. And so... I loved what I did, but was laid off from that particular position because they eliminated the design department. And so when I got to Memphis, um, actually it was while we were still in Missouri, 
We lived in a very small town, Poplar Bluff, Missouri. There's absolutely nothing there. <laughs> a J.C. Penney, a Kmart, and a Walmart. And so there are not a lot of jobs for interior designers. <laughs> I would see that that might be the case. Um, no, not a lot of not lots of opportunity there. So mm-hmm. while there, I basically taught myself how to do a lot of things. I built furniture. I taught myself to sew. I painted lots of things. I, I used our rental home as a place to kind of get some skills under my belt. And at the same time, Instagram was in its incubation, like it had just started. And I was an early adopter. And I'm from West Memphis. So there were lots of people in the area that knew me. So Mm -hmm. when I moved home, they were like, okay, how about you make me a coffee table? And how about you make these pillows for me? So as I as we relocated, since I was closer to home, I got lots of people going, OK, I want you to make this for me. Can you do this for me? And as I made products for people, they would go, OK, well, what color paint should I paint this? And so it turned into taking on more broader projects. Um, and that's how Newbie Interiors was born. My husband was like, well, you're unemployed otherwise. <laughs> so, and people keep asking more. Uh, yes, <laughs> give, it, so give an inch, they take a mile. <laughs> you should totally start a business. And we had our differences on how that business should start. As always, as um, any good uh, entrepreneur. Yes, yes. indeed. Um, but Newbie Interiors was born here in Memphis once we moved here. And it, it didn't feel like a major feat in Memphis, Memphis already feels very comfortable. I mean, we're Southern and there's it's slow moving and you there aren't a lot of hindrances here when you say you want to start a business. Now, keeping a business going, that may be a different <laughs> thing. But if you have an idea, you can start a business with zero problems. Um, but I think it was social media that really catapulted my business people who couldn't physically see me in person could still see my work. Yeah. Um, and that was the biggest um, effect on starting a business here in Memphis. Word of mouth and people. I, I was connected with small businesses that wanted products for me and they would walk in. I did a coffee table for a hair salon here. People would walk in and ask about the table and and that was all she wrote. And there you go. <laughs> I feel like we also just glossed over the fact that you taught yourself to do all these things. So I have also <laughs> sewn. My grandmother tried to teach me how to sew. And that is no small feat. So I also don't want like, to make furniture, sew, like paint, like do all this stuff. I feel like you were just like, yeah, I just taught myself. And then like... <laughs> Full stop, and I'm like, hold on, wait, 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 wait. I painted a, a one accent wall in a in a small guest bathroom recently, and that was a feat for me. So, <laughs> well, I did not stick with sewing long. Um, I realized this was not my forte, so I let it go after a couple rounds of pillows and oh. curtains. Um, <laughs> I let it go. I tried. But you. yes, building furniture was a, a passion, and for my first probably ten clients. I did everything. I did the painting. I installed wow. all the furniture, assembled everything, hung the curtains. At, like, wow. It was just me. I was a man of one. I actually was a man of one until a year ago. So, <laughs> so big clap, big round of applause oh, well, for having we a team. Growth. Yes, thank you. sustainable growth, yes, in that way. <laughs> so, um, so from the interior design business here in Memphis, mm-hmm. you also have had your wonderful fame. On, Indeed. on television. On Would TV. you like to tell us a little, again, the Spark Notes version? There's plenty on Google if you just Google <laughs> this lovely lady's name, Carmian Hamilton. Yes. And you can catch yourself up to speed if you have been living under that undecorated rock of yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, again, social media has been the the bloodline of my existence in, when it comes to business or air quote, fame. I don't feel famous at all. Um, But social media was a thing. Like I said, being an early adapter of Instagram, um, I've been on Instagram for 10 years. And so I every new iteration of the platform I've adopted. And it really was the the inception of Instagram stories Mm -hmm. where people really got to see who I was as a person because before then it was just pretty pictures of the things that I did. Yeah. Um, And then Instagram stories, I became a storyteller. Like I 
in good morning. Sense. Yes, yeah. literally in its truest sense. And I, I think people, they loved what I did and loved my design aesthetic. But I mean, it sounds weird to say, but they fell in love with me when they got to know. Me. I'm like, I'm a pretty likable person. Yeah, so I was about yeah. to say, that doesn't sound weird at all. Because yeah. it, made, it sounds weird to it say like, about yourself. Yeah, it also made your pretty things like come to life and feel authentic. And, and Yes, yeah. and that is what I focused on, being an interior designer. I knew a lot of people didn't have an understanding of why interior design was even a thing. Like, what what's the difference between a decorator and a designer? And yeah. why do, what are these things that make interior design a a, a, a business or even something to study. And so I wanted to teach people the principles of design, like what is scale and balance and color theory and all of these things. And educating people led to lots of other opportunities. It gave me a different, it separated me from other interior designers. Most don't like to give their tips and tricks away, but at the time I felt like I can't be everyone's interior designer, so let me empower you to make decisions for yourself mm-hmm. or understand why this even looks good. Um, and so with that, the short version is a casting director sh- hit me up in my DMs <laughs> and said, we have a project that we think you'd be amazing for. And I turned him down probably six times. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> and eventually he was like, no, I'm serious. He found my email at that point. Opportunity knocked and then uh, banged. Yes, and then it banged. Send a carrier pigeon. Yeah. All of the things, a message in a bottle, everything. <laughs> Smoke signal. They were, they were. Yes, he was very persistent. And I finally went through the interview process. And all of this happened in February and March of 2020. And... By the time the pandemic hit was just when I was hearing that I was one of the finalists selected to be a part of this project. I had zero idea what the project was, <laughs> but it wasn't until July that I found out it was Design Star. Um, they said HGTV was bringing it back. It had been on hiatus since 2013, and it was my favorite show on the network. And I was very excited to do it, but also at the same time, my business exploded over the summer of 2020. I took my business virtual the week before the pandemic happened. You're that, impressive yes. timing. Uh, You're that early yes. crystal ball. <laughs> the early adapter of a lot of things yes, here. Yes, indeed. And so by by June, I believe, I had tripled my salary from my corporate job that I had left the year before. So Congrats. Big snaps. Big Thank snaps you. for that. That's huge. So when they came back, like, okay, we're ready. I was like, no, that's fine. Uh, my job's doing, my business yeah. is doing great. I'm just yeah. going to stay home and keep doing this. And my husband and best friend at the time were like, you'll have your business as long as you want, but when are you going to have another opportunity to be on TV? And I said, okay, ultimately. Had zero idea what I was doing until after that first episode of Design Star. I'm like, okay, I think I can do this. And my only goal was to make it past the first episode. And lo and behold, I won the whole thing. And so <laughs> <laughs> Throw confetti. No, no, yes. Right? Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So as a result of being the grand winner, yes. um, you then got a show of your own, correct? I did. Two weeks after leaving set, I was on the phone with the production company and we were on a creative call. Like, what does the show look like? What do you want to do? What does it consist of? We want to make sure we incorporate things from Design Star that people know you for. And I said, I don't care what we do as long as we're shooting in Memphis. That's the only thing. That was the only input I had in our initial call. I said, number one, I'm home and I'm never leaving home again because... (laughs) Because Design Star almost broke me. But also, I knew at the time there was nothing positive uh, about Memphis outside of Elvis and barbecue. And not everyone is a barbecue eater and Mm -hmm. not everyone is an Elvis lover. But I'm like, my existence in Memphis consists of neither. I was vegan at the time. Like, I'm an ex-vegan. Sorry, (laughs) vegan people. Um, But I'm like, I want the world to see Memphis the way I see it and experience it. So if we're going to have a production crew, if we have a budget that's going to pull people from around the country to work on a project no matter where I am, then bring it to Memphis. Also, I'm not going anywhere else. So... So do with that so what you will. So do with that what you will. What you will. Exactly. And and they said, oh, absolutely. I was wondering what their response initially was. Was there any hesitation not, from the jump? Not a single 
smidge of hesitation. I love that. They were like, Memphis is you and you are Memphis. It only makes sense. We're oh, coming to Memphis. We love that. Thank you for that. bringing the yeah. cameras to oh, Memphis and getting to show off our city. Yes. Um, we love that that was a priority for you and, and continuing to showcase Memphis and all of its amazingness. Um, what is it about Memphis homes and people for you and getting to work in this this city in particular? Um, you know... I, I've been in the city for 10 years, but it took me probably four or five years to find my people. Um, and I, I had a friend or two before that point, but neither were in the creative community. Like, mm. I didn't know any other creatives uh, when I moved here. And it was a blogging event that I met my now photographer and several other women that weren't necessarily interior designers, but they had creative brains and loved to blog and storytell and loved beautiful things. And I was like, I found my people. And it was instant when I went to this meetup. And in meeting them, they introduced me to this city and the local places that you never get to hear about and the artists and other creatives in town that make the city as cool as it is and the more people I met and the more places I went I was like no one in the world knows about this city or knows these things about this city so I'm it's my mission now to make sure they know and some of my content that I put online was highlighting places I would go where I get my nails done where we're going to dinner where's my favorite coffee shop all of these other things and the more I talked about it, the more I would get messages like, oh, I never know Memphis, never knew Memphis had anything like that. Mm-hmm. Or I've never heard of these things. And wow, Memphis looks so cool. Like, And it just put a battery in my back to do it more. And this city just, I love, a, I love an underdog story. And it's been an underdog for over 60 years now at this point. And I'm like, it's time. It's time to it's, flip that script. It's time. Like, I'm sick of... Well, sorry, Nashville. I'm, I, I, <laughs> I'm like, it's not. Memphis is the cool little sister of Nashville, mm-hmm. and it needs to be recognized as such. And we could have economies just like Atlanta or D.C. Mm-hmm. or Chicago. Like, we are just as cool as those cities, but it takes infiltration of the interior to get the people on the inside to look at it differently. So, people on the outside will appreciate it. Yeah. I'm like, I got to do this from the inside out. As if I'm here, this is now my job. I love that. It's interesting, too, that from a lot of the people that we've talked to are also saying that it seems like Memphians are harder on themselves than anybody they else are. is. They are. And I, I say it as seeing the forest through the trees. Like you, especially if you watch the news or... Well, basically just watch the news. (laughs) I stopped watching the news probably five years ago, and it changed my life. If I need to check the weather, I check the app. Yep. I check Instagram. I check the Daily Memphian or Commercial Appeal, whatever it is on Instagram to be able to control the negativity around the city. I have been here 10 years and have not experienced a negative thing, like knock on all the wood here. (laughs) Yeah. But I, I just could not connect with any of the news that was happening here. I'm like, this is not my experience. And I know it's the experience of a lot of people, right. but it cannot be your only experience right. in the city. And so I continue to combat that by showing the good. Um, I've met so many people in areas around the city that have never left their area, like mm-hmm. people in Fraser that have never been out of outside of Fraser, people that have never been downtown. And I'm like, you are missing so much greatness because you haven't seen anything that has made you want to go in those places. So let me highlight these things, put it on a public platform to draw you to the places that I love so you can love them too and start to transform your thinking about the place you live. Absolutely. I mean, we're all about having the big megaphone and celebrating. We think there's so many wonderful things worthy of celebration right here yes, in Memphis. So, absolutely. yeah. And great we, advice. Like if you if you haven't found your niche yet, it's it's not because the city doesn't have it to offer. Like exactly. go meet someone. Find it. Find the person who knows the ins of where to go. Follow Carmion on Instagram so you can get her tips on where to go. Like, yes. 
people will lay out the blueprint for you. And, and we've got such a wealth of opportunity like those other bigger markets you mentioned at a fraction of the cost. Exactly. I'm like, the, the, the ground is wide open for you to start whatever you want to start. You want to create something. There's so much opportunity here. You are fighting against very few people to make space for yourself. Like, it's one of the only places that you have this space and opportunity to create and build. So take it, which I am trying to do. <laughs> <laughs> Grab hold. Um, so you've been really vocal about the importance of your online presence and how that mm-hmm. helped kind of, you said, like, be the bloodline. Like, it helped get things off the ground and everything yes. um, with your blog and social media. Are there any challenges with being so public? Not for me. Okay. <laughs> Open book. I've done yeah. it for so long and very early on developed boundaries in the online space. I've been an open book. I literally have been an open book. book. My blog started 12 years ago, and it was about my relationship with my then fiancé at the time. So I've told every type of story you can tell about your life. And so I've never had a problem with information. Okay. My separator is treating, behaving in a way that I want to be treated online. So I tell my audience, good morning, every morning. I say hello when they see my face. I over explain things because I know people have questions about everything. And I'm like, I, I try to overdo it so people have an understanding that they're coming here for information, but... I'm also a human being, Mm -hmm. and you're going to treat me like one. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are instances where some people would like to treat me as Google because I do have a plethora of information, but those people quickly are told, number one, hello. (laughs) Number Mm -hmm. two, Google will do way better at that than I will. So it's just I behave in the way that I want to be treated, and I remind people of the way that I expect to be treated in my space online. Like, And if you don't care for that, then you have a whole lot of other places online to go. (laughs) Absolutely. And you will love it over there. (laughs) Um, Well, as a follower myself, I can definitely attest to the fact that it is fun to go on that journey with you. Oh, well, thank um, you. To like to see, you know, the great things and the happy success moments and then the hard moments, too. It's definitely, you know, can feel like. We're a bit of a family. like, And that's exactly how I feel and how I treat it. Like, I can't come and share all the good stuff and not share any of the bad because you're only getting a fraction of the story. And, again, I'm a storyteller. You can't have a good book with just good stuff in it. Mm. You need a transition. You need a climax. You need a downfall. You need recovery. And that's what life is all the time. And it changes from minute to minute and day to day. So... There's always a new story (laughs) to be told, (laughs) which is why I keep telling it and showing up every day. What chapter is this for Carmion? That's a good question. I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I turned 37 in about six weeks, so we'll say it's the end of chapter 36. Okay. Um, I'm also, like, for the first time in my life, as an adult, making adult decisions by myself. Um, I did lose my husband a year ago, and but I met him when I was 20. Mm-hmm. And so now navigating life without having to consider another adult, like that's new. Yeah. Um, the culmination of my swimming pool was the first decision that I ever made on my own. My husband was so against having a pool for the six years we were in our home. I said, no, we're getting a pool and I have it and it's my favorite decision I've ever made (laughs) for myself, but I also made it for my son and then our community of friends that I love because none of us had access to a swimming pool before Mm -hmm. unless you were a member of the Y or the Croc. Um, But I wanted... Sneak into pools in this city. (laughs) No, no. Hit me up privately. I'll tell you you where I've found pools. Jumping fences over (laughs) here, Aaron. Jumping fences, going to hotels. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted wanted my friends to go to a pool without... On their own terms. Yes, without worrying about being kicked out. Without breaking the law, Aaron. (laughs) Jeez. Um, But yeah, that's... It's the first decision I made for me Mm -hmm. by myself. And I'm like, it was one of those that taught me like I can do this I'm fully capable and so I'm coming into my own I feel like I I met I I met myself this version of myself around like 32 where I was actually 
comfortable with who I was in my skin, with my nerdiness. That's also kind of cool sometimes. Um, all but the now, time. Well, thank you. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> um, but now it's it's literally just on a shelf. Like, okay, what are we doing? And every day is a new situation and a new decision to be made. And so I feel like I'm starting a whole new life, but with a great backstory. So I take everything that was with me, but yeah. it's all new. Um, one of my favorite, actually, TED Talks, we were talking about this before we came on the air, um, it was for TED Women, and it talked about actually grief. I have everybody, you know, doesn't get through their book unscathed. Mm -hmm. um, and so whatever way grief or loss has touched you. Um, and she, the TED Talk is literally about how you don't move on. You move forward with, with these people. Exactly. And that it's not something that is like a hard stop. It's like no. I am who I am because of all of these wonderful things and all of these fantastic experiences. Exactly. And so I do. I love that. Um, it, I, I come back to it time and time again um, when I need a little bit of a little pick me up. Understood. I am the exact same way. Yes. Um, so balance and resilience have felt like a couple of common themes in your book. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about what you do for some self-care? When all other that, than this swimming pool, oh yeah, that's yeah. a that's I'll, a new I'll wait one. for my invite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you will see one shortly, um, but yes. Yeah, so the the pool is very new. Like I've been in it all of three times. It's only been okay, open wow. for a weekend. Ugh. Congrats! Well, less than a week. How cool! Yes. Yeah, so um, so that's new. But now I have a habit of taking my son to school in the morning, and I have about two hours before my work day starts, and so I come back put my feet in the pool, and that's where I drink my coffee. Oh, um, so that's, that's my vibes. Yes. That's some oh vibes. Oh, my gosh. It is the best. I'm loving that. Um, it does make it hard to get to work. Um, <laughs> it makes it hard to leave that vibe. I would, I would say. Book, book no early morning meetings. Uh, so yes. we, noon only. we sincerely apologize <laughs> for making you drink your coffee here with us in the studio. Not a problem. <laughs> sorry, I'm not sorry that we made you come uh, well, here and chat yeah, with us. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> I, I fully forgive you guys. <laughs> um, but my favorite thing to do, because I do so much is nothing mm. to I love absolutely nothing I have to lay either across my bed or on my sofa I'll either scroll Instagram or I'll just turn something on Netflix like nailed it like that oh yes. gosh, so requires fun. nothing so from me Requ and yes. that requires no mental capacity yes, to, that to is invest my, in <laughs> <laughs> that is my self care to just shut down purposefully yeah, yeah. A little veg I love it um, so can you talk to me? You mentioned your unique perspectives about motherhood here, mm -hmm. but how has that evolved in the last year as you've come into kind of your own? Yes. Um, so in that that motherly podcast interview that I did, I gave the example or um, kind of the, I don't I'm losing the word, but I described my parenting strategy oh, yes. as being a gardener and my mm -hmm. son being a seed. And it's not my job to tell the seed what to do. The seed knows what to do. Ooh. My job is to give the seed the environment that it mm -hmm. needs to thrive, making sure its environment is healthy, that it's got proper soil that's not diseased, to make sure it has sunlight and water and fertilizer. I never tell the seed what to do. You can't control the seed. The seed is going to do what it does no matter what you do. You just give it the environment that it needs to succeed. So that's the parenting strategy I've had my entire life. Well, my entire life as a parent <laughs> <laughs> for the last 13, it's been almost serving 14 you well, years. I think. Yeah. Yes, and and really just letting a kid be a kid is, is part of that, letting a seed be mm -hmm. a seed, not giving the seed responsibilities. <laughs> A sunflower isn't a sunflower, or you don't get sunflower seeds from a sunflower until it's done doing its job as a flower. So yeah. you don't interrupt the process. But now, lately, especially being a single mom, I, I've i really just listened more to my kid and acknowledging that he's been a whole human this entire time. But now, especially that the dynamics of our relationship have changed, it takes full-on conversations to understand where you stand with your kid. Mm -hmm. 
are you, are you the parent that your kid wants to have? Are you doing what you need to do for the seed to function? And now the seed can talk back and tell you what it (laughs) likes and doesn't like. But are you listening and are you giving it room to vocalize what it likes and doesn't like? Um, You create an environment of respect, but you also have to create an environment of open channels of communication. Um, I realized about a month ago, um, talking to my son about his dad, asking him, if you were to describe your dad, if someone asked you how to describe your dad, what would you say? And he said he was a really great guy, but he was rough around the edges. And I'm like, okay, well, what made him great? Mm-hmm. This is me. Let's yeah. talk about it and not react. Okay. <laughs> well, he took care of us and he took care of a lot of people and he made sure we were safe and all of these things. And I was like, okay, well, what made him rough around the edges? And he referred to getting in trouble and being disciplined. And I mean, all forms of discipline. My husband was really creative when it came to (laughs) how we were going to implement discipline. Setting a better, different path, yeah. It would be things, my husband was an athlete, so it would be things like sitting the wall for 60 Ooh, seconds, yeah, yeah. which yeah. is, my kid was dying after 20. So, like, <laughs> as, as am I. At, at, <laughs> right. At, at a wall sit. <laughs> yeah. So things like that, or holding books straight out. Ooh, so, But yeah, they're yeah. all things I'm pretty sure my son remembers very well. He probably doesn't remember <laughs> what he got in trouble for, but he remembers those things. So he, his... Rough around the edges was the way his dad disciplined. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm a mom. You're a kid. You you need correction. And this is what we do as parents. And I then thought about the fact that I was with my husband for 15 years. We were together. We met in college and had a ton of time together. We had lots of ups and downs, but we were together as adults. So I had the benefit of saying... And this is me having to grow into the confidence to say, this is what I don't like about our relationship. This is what I would like to change or whatever it is. Get his perspective, understand his side and make the changes to make our relationship better. And kids don't get to do that with their parents. They don't get to say, this is what I don't like about your parenting style. This Mm -hmm. is what I would need. They don't know what they don't know, but they know how you make them feel. So I was sitting at this table with my son and realizing he didn't get the opportunity to develop the relationship he wanted with his dad. He had a great dad, yeah. amazing, present father, but he didn't. He doesn't have the closure that I have because mm-hmm. I got to tell my husband exactly how I felt, and so did he, but my son did not. And so now... I am weighted with the responsibility of making sure the last parent he has is the parent that he wants to have. And that is my guiding principle on a day-to-day basis. And I was taught that by a 13-year-old. And you only can accept those things when you accept a kid as a human being and not a kid. So you're raising humans, people, not, not children. They're only a kid for a very short window let them be humans and listen to them. Wow. That is, I took so many nuggets away from that, that I'm going to for sure use the flower, the seed like analogy yes. with my, with my own daughter. I'm going to, who she's only three and a half, but Lord, oh, fun. Lord, give me the strength that's to a, shepherd her spirit. That's one of those jumping beans. Oh seeds. yes. So yes. <laughs> but I mean, the truth about like, listening and mm-hmm. giving them the space and understanding that they don't have that full like story that yes. that mm-hmm. like backstory that you exactly. or I would see and I'm like I there's a difference we talk all the time um, at work about intent and impact yes and I'm like we got to bring it home and be like you know I know you intended but mm-hmm. I'm like she's three and a half like, exactly she know, she her world she is literally the, the size problem. of a pea right. I'm like <laughs> I'm like, she's not she's not manipulating you. She's literally yes. just three and a half. <laughs> Their world is so small. Their experiences, experiences are so few. They haven't developed the coping mechanisms that even most adults haven't have mm-hmm. developed at this point. So you have to give them the grace to feel their feelings. They haven't been able to control it, but you got to feel your feelings. Otherwise, you're this adult that 
spews out their feelings in places that they shouldn't. And if you can control or help give the environment, the proper environment to a kid, they're much healthier and functioning and empathetic adults down the line. It's It's okay to apologize to your kids. That's one of the biggest things as well. But you have to just remember they're human, but their world as a human has is three years. Yeah. Three. Thirteen right. compared to my almost 37. Yeah. And I've learned most of what I know in the last seven years. So right. he's got a long way to go to be a fully functioning adult. But what I know now, I want to give to him as early as possible. So he's not 38 years old mm-hmm. trying to figure it out or trying to heal from the way I parented him. Oh, shoot. Yeah. What wow. power in both, you know, trying to shield him from what he doesn't need, but then open up and listen and, and teach these vulnerability things. And I think such a perfect example of you walking the walk. You talk about being authentic, and I appreciate so much the vulnerability and sharing that. Like, I'm not a parent, knock on wood, yet. I would love to be one day, and um, I just really appreciate that perspective. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank absolutely. You. So what would your son say his design aesthetic is? To f- just switch oh, things up a little goodness. bit. Oh, His I could probably guess his exact answer would be, I don't know. Does he have any requests when you implement things around the house? So, not around the house. He doesn't care. The only time he's involved or when he cares or when it's time to decorate for holidays. Ooh. So he's a celebrator. He's a celebrator. I feel this. I feel this deeply. So, Christmas and Halloween especially. Um, And we we did his room. Two years ago, mm-hmm. and I said, "Okay, I I have an I'm an interior designer. <laughs> Obviously, have an idea. Yes, I have ideas. <laughs> However, you will be the guiding decision maker. Fortunately, I have enough education to take what you want and make it look good. <laughs> so let's go. And we started with the paint color, and it was Sonic the Hedgehog blue. And Oof. I was like, "Okay, oh, Sonic. we're doing it. We are doing. We're going there, and we're doing it. So." I, his room is probably my favorite room in our house. It is so bold, and and I love it because it really put my interior design skills to work, working with Sonic the Hedgehog, blue walls, cobalt <laughs> blue walls, but we toned it down with navy and added a little pop of red because he loves red and blue together. I'm like, we can't oh, make... Sonic. Sonic's yes. Sonic. Yes. got those red you, kicks. Exactly. He's got a patriotic room. We're, we're exactly. on a Sonic kick at my house. So, yeah. <laughs> Sonic is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but I I love it. All of the art is intentional in there. Um, but it's it's the most fun room in our house. But it's still... It's a kid's room, but it's the coolest room. Like, I can, I can be there. I've done photo shoots in his room because... <laughs> That blue wall color is amazing as a background. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, it. I love that at first it was like, Ugh. right. Like, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to work. And now it's your favorite room. Now it's that my brings favorite me room. so much joy. Yes. <laughs> so one of my favorite sections as a listener, my new new co-host, is the lightning round, where we just rapid fire hit you with some questions. Yes. Um, and so I feel like we just talked about your son's room. Typically, what is your favorite room to design? Ooh, to home. design bathrooms. Bathrooms? Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. Sorry. Mm-hmm. We, 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 sorry. We, we can dig into the answers. <laughs> Rapid fire first. Um, okay. Do you have a favorite fabric? Linen. Ooh. Color palette? Black. Everything. Pattern? Abstract. Would you rather design for someone who knows what they want or someone who is a blank slate? Knows what they want. No, I take it back. Blank slate. <laughs> <laughs> Blank slate. Uh, favorite Memphis collaboration? Oh, Inkwell. And do you name your plants? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about one plant, baby. Um, one plant is a rubber tree plant, and it has, when it grows new leaves, they're, the casing on them are pink, and her name is Ethel because of Ethel Hedgeman Lyle, who was the founder of my sorority. Um, lots of backstory around uh, some of my plants, but yes, that's that's Ethel. And she's pink the tallest plant in the house right now. Naturally, yep. naturally. pink and green. Love it, love it. I have some questions. Okay. Um, bathrooms. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so number one, they are typically the smallest space in a house. Yes. Mm-hmm. Outside of a closet, 
Um, but you can pack in the most impact design-wise in a bathroom. So you are picking out, there's floors you have to address, there's wall tile you have to address, there's usually some kind of smooth surface, drywall or whatever that gets another, that's another opportunity for a different material. You have a ceiling in every space, (laughs) just about. Um, So your ceilings, but then you have so many different materials that have to go in. You have shower fixtures, you have your sink fixtures, there's toilets, there's hundreds of thousands of types of toilets in the world. Most people hmm. don't even know that because you go in a Home Depot and there's three. Right. So, yeah. but <laughs> That's big facts. That's why yeah. not. All big of these facts. toilets. And toilets come in different colors still to this day. Um, and then mirrors and lighting. The, the world of lighting Ooh. is insane. Immense. Yes. yes. Insane. And then how do you soften up this space with all these hard surfaces, rugs and shower curtains and window treatments and then how do you make it more interesting or personalized artwork and specific style toothbrushes? And how do you like to store huh. your things? And so everything in a bathroom, even the things you use, like your toothbrush, can be completely designed and beautiful so that you can leave them out on the counter. Countertops, sinks, like all these other things. Mm-hmm. But yes, I I love that they're so small. The square footage is small, but you can you have so many decisions to make. And then putting the puzzle pieces together to make this one beautiful space. Um, that's why I love them. There's there's so much to do in such a small space. I gave myself credit for putting a, a fresh paint of coat and then a paper and clay vase for my makeup oh, brushes. I yes. was I was real proud of that. But that, now that sounds amazing. I gotta go look at my toothbrush. I need. I want to buy a new one. I mean, and, for all the reasons that you just said that you love bathrooms, that's what terrifies me about that's redoing typically, a bathroom. Yes, that's what terrifies the civilians <laughs> of the world. Um, but that is why. I maintain a design business. Um, so everyone that's overwhelmed typically calls an interior designer for at least a consultation, which is a great piece of advice if you're terrified of where to start. But my my biggest piece of advice is even if you feel like you can't afford an interior designer or afford this big, huge project, call one for a consultation, just like you would call a landscape architect for a consult. They come with ideas and solutions, and you pay a small fraction of their normal fee, but they help you take a lot of the stress out of all the decisions that you plan to make. Also give you guidance for some of the things that you want to tackle on your own or you feel like you can't afford to hire them for. But a designer is always worth a consultation if you're one of those that are overwhelmed by projects. Yes, me. Yes. Be me. And then my other question is linen. It linen. Wrinkles. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I am an all linen bedding person. Okay. I also love to wear it. I don't really care about wrinkles unless I know I'm going to be photographed standing. Oh, that's what I was about to say, like satin or uh, silk. Yeah, the same like way. Every, like, everything wrinkles. So it's so true. It's, it's just part of life. Like, we live. I, exactly. <laughs> we are not hangers. We live in our clothes. Ta-da. And we live in our homes. So why be concerned about wrinkles for something that you're going to lay on, sit on all the time? Um, but linen bedding, it, bedding is what came to mind uh-huh. in the rapid fire question. Yes, okay. Um, but bedding, it, it is the most luxurious thing ever. Linen is breathable, so it is wonderful all year round. Um, Especially it in washes, Memphis. Yes. <laughs> it washes and dries well. Like it just gets better the more you use it. Um, it can be expensive sometimes, but places like Target are making it more affordable. But there's there's nothing like climbing in a bed of linen sheets. And I mean linen fitted, flat, blanket, duvet, pillowcases, all of it. Like give me all the linen on a bed. It will change the way you sleep, uh, See, literally. I, I'm a flannel fan, which oh. is like – Darn near impossible in Memphis. Cannot. I try you're... so hard to like push it, and mm-hmm. then it's maybe just too only hot. for a few so weeks com- like, and for the week of Christmas. February. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Christmas even. feels like fall here, right? So you're you're pushing During it to maybe February. When yes. they come in February, <laughs> February and March. That's yeah, that's where you get your flannel, flannel. <laughs> when um, the power's out. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that you any rules that you have in a house, or is everything meant to be? You said, like, lived in just, like, the linen you wear. Do you, like, are you a red wine on a white couch person? Yeah, live it up. (laughs) Live it up. 
Um, there are solutions for everything nowadays. It is 2022. They have figured out how to make red wine on a white sofa a possibility. So there are things called performance fabrics and scotch guards and all those things. So you don't have to treat your things very precious. Um, I am of the mind that the things we bring in our homes, we bring in for a purpose and they have a job to do. So they do their job. Like even your fine china, which I believe you should be eating on every day. Retweet, use, retweet. use your things. Mm-hmm. Use your nice, pretty things every day. It will elevate that particular moment, even if you're just eating pizza. Like, use your things. Um, I intentionally do not buy paper plates and styrofoam cups for that reason. I may have a solo cup party every now and then, <laughs> but I use my things. And people are afraid that they're going to break. And I'm like, glass breaks. Mm. If a glass breaks, that glass did what it was supposed to do while it was supposed to do it, and now it's gone to glory. (laughs) Get another one. Like, it's perfectly fine, but treating your things preciously, you lose the point of having them. If you can't use them and appreciate them for what they are, then why do you have them? Also, especially if you live amongst other people, you have these nice things. You want to show the people in your home that they deserve nice things. Use your nice things just to have regular old family dinner, even if it's a Kroger rotisserie chicken. Mm-hmm. Put it on your fine china. Your family will appreciate it. Yeah. Um, those things just make a huge difference. But no, I don't have any rules. There's There are design principles, but there are no design rules. Mm-hmm. Ooh, so, I like that. I like that. Yeah, there are no rules. Your house is your house. No one from Pinterest is driving around judging (laughs) you, giving you a (laughs) zero out of 10 stars that's going to show up on Google somewhere. Like, no one is doing that. So make your decisions for your home for you. Yes, you can use inspo and guided principles from the design world, but you have to live in that house. I, I can give you advice, but I don't have to live there. You have to look at those things every day. So you need to love those things that you're bringing into your home. So nobody can tell you what you love and don't love. So just do what you want from the beginning. Break out the good china tonight. I know. And maybe it will break, and that's okay. And that's okay. That's okay. That's okay. I don't know that I'm going to give my three-year-old to China, but I'm going to have some some wine in my my crystal. Um, So how can listeners follow along and participate in the work that you're doing? Well, I am available in the internet space, anywhere you can find the name Carmion Hamilton. So my website is CarmionHamilton.com. I am on Instagram 24 hours a day um, <laughs> at Carmion Hamilton. I am Carmion Hamilton on Twitter and Facebook and Pinterest. Um, so anywhere you're looking for me, just search Carmion Hamilton. So any fun projects or anything on the horizon that you would like to share or talk about? Um, fun projects. So one project that we are in the smack dab middle of is a Fraser project here in town. It's a youth and family resource center, um, which is a pilot project for the city. It's basically a youth intervention facility, and it's the first of its kind, and I, the mission is incredible. It's slowing or trying to prevent the school-to-prison pipeline, addressing the needs of the child um, before just punishing them for their behavior. It's really just addressing the behavior and then giving them solutions to fix whatever's wrong. If your utility, your lights are cut off or your food assistance has been cut off, like what can we do to help this family? And so I, I love the mission of this project, which makes it that much more of a big deal to me. I want the people that come into this place to feel like it's a home and not some mm-hmm. doctor's office. Yeah, not um, sterile. Take or, yes. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the the city had already done some renovations to the building, which is the old library, uh, the old Raleigh library, Raleigh Fraser Library. Um, and it just needed some, it needed a touch of a, interior designer that knows a thing or two yeah. about making things feel like a home. A little TLC. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that one's underway. Um, and the historic Claiborne Temple is a project of mine. We have started phase one. It started earlier this year. So exciting. We are now, it's under reconstruction, just making yes. sure it stays standing when we make it pretty. Yes. <laughs> Such a beautiful <laughs> space, but yes. I'm so excited about it because it will be turned back over to the community. It'll be a community cultural arts center with lots of other functions and 
I'm just honored to be a part of it, considering its cultural relevance to the city of Memphis. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are the two big ones on that involve the city of Memphis that I can talk about oh. right <laughs> now. Uh-huh. Little tease. The rest are little, little, little tease. Yes. I oh, know. Um, something fun is coming to the city. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah. <laughs> That's um, a callback, ladies it, and gentlemen. It, it, <laughs> no <indeed>. more coffee <laughs> for Aaron. <laughs> indeed. So I will I will need as soon as I'm able to announce it, I I will have to be back. Um because That's a it, deal. It'll be a, it'll be a big deal. That when is a it, deal. When it makes it here. So yeah. And um word on the street is you just might join us in February if mm-hmm. we can make it happen. Word on the street and in the studio. Oh, Okay. Yeah. Do, do your thing again. Where's your coffee? Bam, 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 okay. Bam. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. Um, Aaron, do you have any more questions? I have one final one. If you don't, I I just want to say thanks for making Memphis beautiful and, and oh, showing us off. Thank I you. And I, and I might show you my uh, my bathroom paint color later and get your feedback. <laughs> I would love to see it. It was a bold it. choice. I'm still a little. Oh, I'm hesitant. all for bold. <laughs> Go for the bold. It's just paint. I know. <laughs> If it doesn't work, you can just redo it. It's okay. Yeah. See, but I'm like the recovering sticker kid who never put the stickers on anything. So <laughs> that's hard for me to hear. You know, like the sticker stayed on the sticker sheet. Oh, my goodness. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so my final question um, is, what does being a Memphian mean to you? It makes me one of the coolest people in the world. <gasps> Love it. Feels like a big old hug. Instant validation. I know. Yeah. Did. Okay. Yay. Yay. Well, we thank you again, as Aaron said, so for putting your wonderful design eye to on the big screen, making oh, sure that everybody you. sees Memphis for who we truly are. Exactly. Which is not just Elvis and Barbecue, exactly. though I personally am a fan of both. <laughs> but To each his own. Yes. <laughs> yes. But we, um, we're excited for this new chapter in Memphis's, um, I'm not going to say history, um, timeline. No, yes. yeah. I'm looking forward to chapter 37 of Carmion. I know. Oh, it's going to be good. I'm excited. Good. I'm excited. I hear Stay the, uh, tuned. Yes. All righty. Thank well, you so much for having you, me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So thank you, dear listener, for tuning in for our conversation. Um, I... I'm going to be honest, I had really high hopes for Carmian, and she knocked even my highest hopes out of the park with everything from her approach to motherhood and her resilience and how she approaches her journey through grief to her love of linen and her um, that why bathrooms are the, her favorite thing to design. It was just chock full. And great advice about getting out and involved in your city and kind of falling in love with Memphis, finding your niche. Um and truly making your house your own I and special. That. I love that. Every day can be special. I know. I'm going to break out the china. I love it. So um, we have also announced uh, on this show and on our social media and lots of other places that our TEDx Memphis speaker applications are open. And the deadline for those is October 7th. So, Erin, any final Final thoughts, parting words of wisdom. Thanks for tuning in to Meanwhile in Memphis, and we'll see you next week right back here on WYXR 91.7 FM. Bye. episode was made possible by our friends at Independent Bank. You can learn more about them at i-bankonline.com.